We heard Dr. Jackson talk about a number of things. In his book, Designing Healthy Communities, he states that for the community to be healthy, it must have both functional social systems and a functional built environment. And we just heard him say again this morning that in fact the built environment becomes the social policy in concrete. We need more concrete like that. Our first question is going to go to Betsy Del Monte. What or how do we need to be building to make our social system and our built environment healthier in North Central Texas? Well, somebody um, said one word earlier that is important, which is density. We, um, Texas, I think, especially North Texas, has the curse of uh, too much land. We have the ability to just build and build and build, and the um, drive to you qualify thing certainly applies here. Um, the thing that we have the opportunity to do, and that Dallas and Fort Worth both have begun to do, is to improve the livability of our cities, improve the, um, the quality of life even as we work on the quantity of space that we provide. And as we, um, as we continue to have policies that support that, then the, the market of course votes with its feet, with its wallets, and we have a, a cycle of developers saying, well, I, I can't build what people don't buy, the people saying, I can't buy what isn't there, the architects saying, I can only design what the clients hire me to design, and, and um, the policy makers saying, we're only going to pass policy uh, that will keep us in office. So somewhere in that cycle, we've got to change mindsets so that it becomes okay to say we're going to spend less on roads and more on rapid transit, or we're going to provide subsidies to enable grocery stores downtown to stay open so that people can live there comfortably. We don't want just the subsidies that, and we have seen them fail, the ones that offer just the very high-end uh, developments to come in and provide density because not everybody can live in those communities and that doesn't offer the diversity of um, economic situations that Dr. Jackson was talking about. So as we uh, become clearer on what we need as a city to make our cities viable, livable, and uh, walkable, and also make them amenable for families, including schools, public schools, um, that's going to be a big thing is the, the, we haven't talked much yet today about uh, public education and its role in this, but all of those things have to come together to encourage more density in the areas that can support it and, um, and less sprawl and less uh, expansiveness. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and hear from each of our panelists, and then we'll have time for questions. Thank you. Dr. Sanchez, what role does prevention play in designing our built environment? I want to turn that question around and say, what role does the built environment have in um, promoting health and therefore preventing disease? Um, and it may very well be that this is a chicken and egg kind of a conversation and, 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 and it's not so much does it really matter, I don't want to be flip about it, but it's that it's, uh, it's both. Um, and so as I think about uh, the built environment, um, I was chatting earlier with Dr. Jackson and we all know that we should be uh, regularly washing our hands. Uh, if there were no sinks to do so, it would be exceedingly difficult to get that done. Um, so as we think about uh, what I think are the fundamental things that we ought to be doing uh, uh, to improve health and improve the likelihood of health, um, eating healthy, being physically active, maintaining a healthy weight, avoiding tobacco, um, those things will best happen if we think about how the built environment will be the sink, if you will, that will make it possible for us to figuratively wash our hands um, in those four categories. Um, as a country, we're engaged in this conversation around healthcare reform. 
Um, and uh, this may be considered heretical because I work for a health insurance company, but um, the company I work for knows that I come to this place uh, where I work today with a population health, public health frame. It's the way I view um, what we need to do. I am somebody who, uh, if you, if you um, uh, have occasion to hear or see some of my presentations, um, I am somebody who believes that we will achieve health when we begin focusing a little bit more, uh, no, a whole lot more, on the non-clinical approaches that we ought to be embracing to promote health. Um, having said that, we have focused a lot on the medical care delivery system part of what we need to do um, in this conversation around health care reform. And if all we figure out is how to take better care of people once they get diabetes, uh, once they've had the heart attack, once their asthma has been going on for a really long time, don't get me wrong, it's great that we're figuring those things out, but I would say to you that part of the strategy that we have to embrace is a strategy that is about reducing the demand for high cost medical care. That that will happen when we begin thinking about some of the very things that Dr. Jackson is talking about. So some things that we know that, that uh, Dick touched upon. Um, fitness in youth equals better academic performance, actually improved self-esteem, um, and a better ability to, to, to manage um, those diseases that, that do come. Fitness in adulthood, we've already heard, um, lengthens life, actually delays the onset of chronic disease, but one of the messages that I try to deliver over and over again is that it improves productivity in the workplace. Um, so having said all of those things and thinking about how do we create healthy communities, there's a role that companies um, and, 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 and maybe more specifically health insurance companies can be playing. One is to be at the table as these conversations are had locating our businesses in places that are close to those transit centers. And I will tell you that whether it was serendipity or by design, we are two blocks from a DART station that is our headquarters today. Uh, by design, we have a large green space next to where um, we are situated. We have um, taken our quarters in our, uh, in our building, some of the quarters. Um, there are hours where it's kind of dangerous to have to go from one side of the quarter to the other because um, our employees, uh, armed with their uh, tennis shoes, are out uh, walking and we are, in, are encouraging that physical activity. Um, there are some things that we can do in our communities that, as it relates to schools. Um, and uh, uh, Dick mentioned um, uh, the, the, the walking to school initiatives. Uh, but there's also, uh, he mentioned, uh, community gardens in schools. Um, the notion of dual use. We all live or have dri driven by those schools where it says, you know, don't, don't use the football field because uh, we're trying to protect it for the football games or for football practice. We got to figure out how we make those schools a place where um, there is park space and activity space available for folks. Um, and I guess I would leave it as um, thinking about this notion of health in all policies, thinking about health impact assessments, thinking about how the built community can promote health and prevent disease, maybe the, the way we ought to frame this and from the get-go get to that place. And in those instances where we've gone uh, a different way, the, um, the, uh, the mix master near UCLA is a perfect example, how do we use the brain power that we've got here, architects and otherwise, transportation folks, to think about how we retrofit those um, maybe not as well thought out uh, projects and make them projects that are health promoting and disease preventing. All right, thank you very much. Mr. Meadows, your question is what role does uh, what role does transportation planning uh, play in designing healthy communities? Good question. 
<laughs> you know, I really, first of all, just would like to, to, to compliment you all for, 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 for having the dialogue. I mean, it is, it's such an important conversation to be having at this point. And I'm, I'm just so, so pleased to be the transportation guy, transportation commissioner, being invited to, to participate in the discussion. I think it is, it is so foundational from my perspective. I mean, basically, I'm a concrete and rail guy, mostly concrete in Texas, as we know. And so having these sort of discussions really does cause us to, to pause and begin thinking about how it is that we advance transportation infrastructure in the future and how we meet the transportation needs of the citizens, including the health aspect of it, which is clearly an important and an associated factor. You know, let's remember that in the state of Texas, like many high growth states, where in the case of the state of Texas, the, the population is, has increased, you know, 50% in the last 25 years. A huge, the demographic dynamic is what's driving this. And what happens is that when it comes to the scarce allocation or the allocation of scarce resources, you know, we've been reactive. Uh, we've been responsive, basically, to outside factors such as population growth or economic development or, or freight movement, for that matter. Um, but the fact is that, that we have, over the last decade, particularly, I think, working with local communities, been more proactive, beginning to think about some of these, some of these issues that are on the table today. Um, certainly in Texas, what, what we have done, and some of this is stipulated, let me, let me be clear on this, some of this is stipulated by federal law, uh, federal transportation law, rural regulation, and also state, as to how funds can be used. But in Texas, we focused really on this planning initiative where I think it's appropriate, and that is at the local level, working with our, our, uh, our MPOs across the state. The Metroplex is a great example. We have a really strong in the Metroplex Metropolitan Planning Organization that in the, in the, in the genre of transportation planning, I think really has done a good job beginning to advance as you begin to see, Betsy said it a moment ago, in the cities of Dallas and Fort Worth, you're beginning to see real evidence of this sort of transportation planning that speaks very specifically to healthy communities. Um, I think you the, the, the enhancement, federal enhancement programs that, that are allocated or pushed down from the state through the, through the MPOs, um, the hike and bike trail system stays through uh, Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, TxDOT just funded $6.9 million in an expansion effort bringing greater connectivity to the trail. I could go on. In fact, that enhancement program in the state has generated some $330 million roughly dollars over the last decade specifically to enhancing transportation projects, connectivity, hike, bike trails, and those sort of activities in the state of Texas. So there is an, the, the importance and significance of this subject is recognized, and I think it's been embraced. Uh, I think that there are challenges with regard to how funds can be used, but I, I, I'm encouraged about where it is that we are. Thank you. And Brian, uh, your question is, what role does public policy play in designing healthy communities? Another very good question. Before I answer, let me ask everyone out there a question. Raise your hand if you work in health, medicine, health care, something in that vein. Okay, now if you would raise your hand if you work in design, development, planning, city management. Okay. You work in both. That would be one thing to make sure everyone knows. Um, I think uh, Dr. Jackson has made this point in his presentation and others have made it as well. I came to the realization about 12 years ago when I first got my first taste of public health working out in the field. And uh, we would go and do the surveys, we'd go into the communities, and we would ask people our questions about their activity levels and how much do they smoke and how much do they drink and things of that nature. And I was a, really a volunteer in, <clears throat> excuse me, an undergrad in sociology, so I, hadn't, I didn't really know what epidemiology was. I wasn't even quite sure what public health was. I just thought, well, I'm getting this degree in sociology, I'm working with the community, this is great. And um, then I'm looking around and, and I noticed that then they had that follow-up question about the self-rated health. And to the credit of the principal investigator, I also wanted to know, kind of open-ended, what do you think would help improve your health? And sure enough, the answers came out about their built environment. The stop sign that was removed at the intersection and the five-year-old got ran over last week. The uh, gang activity that is housed in the derelict and abandoned house by the landowner in California. 
no offense to anyone in California. <laughs> but um, uh, it, was, it was events like that. And they, they're, they're not um, maybe always thought of. Uh, certainly, the overall built environment is very important, but uh, so is also kind of the, uh, the nuts and bolts. And so when, to the point of public policy, I believe, and one reason why I got into planning, in addition to thinking maybe this is the path to improving public health was through planning, um, is that I believe the government that governs you most locally, <clears throat> excuse me, most proximately is the one you can have the best relationship with that can hear your voice that you can get more action out of. And um, so there's a level of public policy there that's at your local level. Obviously the federal and state uh, plays an important role. Obviously they uh, would be most helpful to us if they're providing us with research and data and that we're aware of it. I know oftentimes they do, we just don't always know where it is and how to find it. Um, but bridging those two gaps are important for public policy and health. The other thought I might leave you with is, you might think of it as international. Um, it's been mentioned about the importance of economic development and related to this, we need a healthy, productive labor force. And I've seen pictures where it looks like Orange County, but it's outside Beijing. I've seen pictures that look like Palo Alto, but it's um, in uh, India, not sure outside which city. So if we can't patent and copyright our way of living, whether that's good or bad, I'll let y'all decide, because um, it was the Hummer and the tract housing style development was not mixed use. Um, I think that we've, we've just got to pay attention also to the economic development side as an angle to work. Sorry, I'm thinking off the top of my head here. But um, the, uh, there, there's, an, there's an advantage there. If, if California has, from what I understand, uh, less allergens, due to their natural environment, not talking about pollution and irritants and things of that nature, but they don't have the western red cedar coming in from New Mexico like we did last week. And they've got a, I mean, I lived in San Francisco, I've lived in Los Angeles. It's great. You can walk, you can bike, generally speaking. Um, it's temperate. Uh, San Francisco is also known as an air-conditioned city. It's, you know, pretty much 60 degrees, it seems like, year-round, which is where we like to crank our homes down to here, it seems for air conditioning in the summer. And the argument that I'll hear is, well, we shouldn't spend all this time and energy and effort on hiking and biking and walkability and all these things because, you know, it, it, it costs money, you can't really use it. <coughs> excuses, excuses. I would say maybe it should be the opposite, that um, because we don't have necessarily this wonderful temperate climate that the West Coast enjoys and we have these challenges, maybe that's all the more reason to really focus on our built environment, to focus on that quality of life, those experiences, especially that I've heard in articles about millennials that they're looking for, that they're choosing places to uh, live based on the lifestyle they want to have, not necessarily the job. Um, so I think we've got some economic development angles that we can work to help make the case for a better built environment for all that also still dovetails with our public health efforts. Okay, thank you very much. I saw the panel members taking notes. Does anybody want to um, say anything to their... You're asking comment? the wrong person. Anybody knows me knows I talk too much, but um, <laughs> uh, just a couple of things that I think are, are quite uh, that are germane. One is a very specific uh, reference to something that uh, is another Institute of Medicine report. I happen to be the chair of the Local Government Actions to Prevent Childhood Obesity report. I would encourage you to go online and have a look at it. It really is kind of an evidence-based, I wouldn't call it a cookbook, but uh, it's not written in the, in the uh, ordinary uh, IOM style, which is um, you might use it as a doorstop. You're not gonna read it because it's just way too thick. This thing is uh, something that uh, you, can, you can read and uh, you can um, easily find. And I'd, I'd give this to um, any one of y'all, but I brought it to give to Dick Jackson. Um, but, it, but it is available and the IOM is happy to share it. And I do think that as it relates to this conversation, there are elements here that are about health and there's elements here that are about the built environment and, and uh, how they go together. I think the other thing I just want to ask the audience, how many of y'all have heard of Blue Zones? Raise your hand. 
Um, and so another thing I would encourage you to write down and, and look up, blue zones. And there's a guy named Dan Butner, uh, who at the time was with National Geographic, and he, was, he, was, uh, he went out on a, on a quest to find those communities that we've heard about where people seem to live well into their uh, 90s and into their hundreds. Um, and he found five places in the world where that seems to be uh, more prominent than in other places. One was in Italy, one's in, uh, uh, one's in uh, Greece, uh, one's in Okinawa, Japan, one's in Costa Rica, and Loma Linda, California is one, but uh, don't go moving there unless you're a Seventh-day Adventist because you do need that sort of religious affiliation to get the Blue Zone effect. Um, you go look them up. There's nine, there's not, an, uh, it, and that's not an endorsement or, or anything else. So, um, but it, no, it is an endorsement, if anything else. Um, but go look it up. The, the, I think the important thing in terms of um, the conversation that we're having here, there's some really important elements. The social, uh, social relationships is a big part of it. Uh, there's nine characteristics. The one I'm going to focus on, and then I'll stop, is that um, moving naturally is one of the nine elements. It seems to be a characteristic. And these are folks who uh, live their lives in a way where they are moving their bodies. And one of the things I like to say is that we've, we've um, adopted adaptive behavior to a maladapted world. Um, and so we have to build in the going on the elliptical machine or, uh, or riding a stationary bike or watching the TV and doing stuff at home and finding a way to run rather than it be the way we live our lives. And so as we think about the built environment, we figure out ways that walking is more of what you do than not. Um, climbing stairs is more of what you do than not. Um, walking your child to school or walking um, on the weekends is more of what you do than not. And put that back into our lives, not because we have to think of it consciously, back to sinks. Um, we use sinks almost unconsciously now. How do we change the built environment so we are unconsciously doing the healthy things? And y'all have heard the term before. How do we make the healthy option the default option? It, it, it's what ends up happening. Um, blue zones, look it up. And the other thing about blue zones has nothing to do with medical care. It is a, it, there's nothing there that has anything to do with hospitals and, and, and doctors. It is about uh, built environment and um, social relationships. Any, um, that's, yeah, one, one thing that was occurring to me as, as everyone else was speaking is we, um, a lot of the people in this room have probably heard nothing yet that is shocking or, or things that they don't know already, but it's how to put it together and how to get, particularly when we're talking about policy and local policy, how do we get the people that need to understand this to understand it, the people who are making policy, whether they're doing it from an economic basis or from a political basis. And one thing that I thought about is maybe an organization, maybe it needs to be ULI, uh, sponsors um, an exercise where every town is asked, what would it be to not own a car in your town? What, where would people live? How would they get their food? How would they get their kids to school? What would be the process, where could they rent a, a zip car or something if they needed one to go out of town? Where could they get a bike? Where would the bike paths be? If, if each town, Fort Worth and Dallas maybe, and then all the smaller ones as well, could just track the path of whether someone could live in that town without a car or not, they would start to see the implications of this. Because it's one thing for us to say, oh, we need a policy where we don't have more than one car per thousand square feet of office, you know, that the numbers don't really bring it home until you start to put it together. So it was just, you know, I know that there are cities where I can fly to and I can get to the airport, I can get on metro, I can go into that downtown, I can get around, I can do what I need to do and never drive a car. I don't think we live in a place where that is always true. And I'd like to see us address that issue. Before we um, ask our audience if they have questions or comments, Bill or Brian, any additional comments? I just have one. Um, it was mentioned about the health impact assessment. The one thing I guess that always struck me as curious from having been in public health and working in a city was it seemed like more time was spent uh, being concerned with grease traps and vent hoods inside a building rather than the connection environment created by you know, a group of buildings. 
as far as a, a health impact. So I hope that maybe in the future a health impact assessment evolves into something that would be welcomed and incorporated by you know, cities and developers as something that's adding value. You know, so. Okay, there's a question. This is for Commissioner Meadows. If, if you wouldn't mind standing up, because it's a little bit hard for everybody to hear. Sure. Thank you. So we have six and a half million people in North Texas right now. Another uh, six million on their way in the next 50 years. It's going to be a ton of infrastructure, um, particularly with regards to getting people around the city uh, transportation wise. So I'm wondering uh, you know, we look at Central Expressway, and it went from four lanes to eight lanes. Um, that took 10 years to build, and now that was only 10 years ago, and it's already clogged. LBJ Express is going to be 26 lanes wide at its widest point. Um, I'm wondering, from a practical point of view, in terms of getting people around the city to allow us to have our economy flourish, do you see the automobile as a solution? Do you see any other solutions coming forward? Is 26 lanes, are we going to have a 50 lane highway by 2050? Is that what it's going to take? Um, <laughs> From a future vision point of view, what do you see? I really appreciate you asking the question because there are a couple of facts I think that just need to be known and I don't think are widely known in Texas. And one is the primary source of revenue that we have historically used to advance uh, transportation infrastructure has been the motor fuels tax. And the motor fuels tax is restricted constitutionally to bridges and roadways. So. When we begin talking about alternative modes of transportation, specifically the high-speed rail initiatives that I can talk about a little bit that we have ongoing in Texas today, uh, I can, the, 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 the commuter rail initiatives that we have going on in Texas today have been extremely frustrating in the sense that we do not have a, a reliable, predictable, viable funding source to advance those sort of very expensive propositions. And I think that the, the I'm answering your, 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 your in question a little bit indirectly. I think the answer is that, 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 the, that the current mode of addressing transportation challenges in a reactive fashion by building more roadways and expanding roadways is really not sustainable. I think we know that. Certainly that will continue to be part of the solution, but with that comes some overlay issues that play directly into this conversation, which is, which is air quality and health. So those are all issues. Um, the fact is that, that, that what I believe that we're going to see uh, in the case of development, first of all, of high-speed rail, which actually is, if you'll pardon me, accelerating in terms of not just a concept, it, it, it actually is, is under very direct study, specifically the Metroplex to Houston quarter, as well as a quarter from, from it's an expanded geographic scope, Oklahoma, Oklahoma City to Laredo, uh, basically along the Interstate 35 quarter, which is a little less behind, if you will, um, uh, the, 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 the Houston Metroplex study, but you know what likely will happen there is, because resources are going to be scarce, um, is that you're going to see the private capital, just as we're utilizing to advance these major transport to roadway infrastructure projects across the state at this very point in time. Some 16 billion, as you probably know, you all know that driving the Metroplex every day, we're building all over the Metroplex. But the key to that has been private capital. And I think that what you're seeing is, and there's been expressed, I think, public, fairly well known uh, for those who follow transportation, interest on the part of several different national groups. The Japanese, for example, are one group that are very interested in the Houston to Metroplex corridor. So I think you're going to see high-speed rail develop further. TxDOT, through federal government programs and state funding, the limited funding that we actually have some flexibility with, have made a contribution to several uh, rail transportation projects in the Metroplex, specifically about $96 million over the last several years into what's known as TexRail, uh, following the Cotton Belt route. A uh, streetcar project in Dallas uh, has been received funding funding from us, and we're coordinating with them. No, they're not all. They're not there. But the TexRail project could be. The TexRail project certainly could be a public-private partnership, PPP. Uh, that's a very real possibility. And in fact, it may be actually be a concession. There is a, there is a consortium private ent of entities that are interested in developing that. So I think that the, the answer, that, that's a very long answer to your question, but the fact is that I think we will become more and more multimodal over time. So sorry, just to clarify what you're saying, you know, since we have a shortage of funding for these alternative projects, you're saying because the gas tax will only go to roads and bridges? Constitutionally restricted. Constitutionally. So 
we have to look for alternative funding mechanisms in the form of public private partnerships. Or or, or or public funds. But 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 one solution I think is likely to be public private partnerships. Just because the capital costs associated with delivery of any of these it's just it's, it's just enormous. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. Georgie? Mm -hmm. This is simplistic, but you could change the constitution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The other thing is that I thought I understood that because of the reduction in yeah. Those are those are obviously questions. Those are great questions. I appreciate you asking them because first of all, those are obviously your elected representatives' decisions. You know, I mean that's just that's the that's the bottom line. I mean, there that is the bottom line. And the state legislature has the opportunity to put forth a constitutional amendment that we would vote on that could modify that. Or there could be an, a different source of revenue that would not carry with it the limitations or restrictions. And the last, po and last point that you make is a very good one and I think one that's well worth making. You know, sometimes you think about the, the unintended consequences of good public policy. You know, the gasoline or motor fuels tax more specifically because it includes diesel. Um, is a percentage in Texas. Not a, it is not a percentage, it's pennies per gallon. So if, ga if gasoline, let's say, is $5 a gallon or $2 a gallon, it doesn't matter because the tax collected in Texas is 20 cents. Now, what has happened is that with, 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 with federally mandated fuel efficiency, Fuel, fuel economy of motor vehicles has increased fairly dramatically over the last two decades. And so what's happening since the last time the gasoline tax was increased in 1991 is that fuel economy has increased. We have more cars on the road today that are actually burning less gas, which means they're paying less taxes. So just at a time that, that, that you need more revenue to, to, to address your transportation infrastructure, you actually are getting less. Thank there's, you. There's I I hope that everybody's taking notes because when we go into the breakout sessions, you're getting some great ideas here in the discussion about what are, what are the next steps that we should take, like working with elected officials, like looking at changing policy, like instituting health impact assessment, which can help you lessen the amount of unintended consequence that you end up dealing with down the road. Okay. Yeah, there's Who a lady, lady right there. Yes, please stand by. Thank you. Andy Bell from Dallas, Texas. And I'm a bicycle pedestrian planner, and I sit on the Texas Transportation Commission's Bicycle Advisory Committee. And I want to first make a comment. Back in 1991, after Ice-T was passed, I talked to a man uh, who worked with uh, bike parking and transit, and he's known for uh, bicycling, walking, black box modeling. And I asked him, I said, the environmental community here is upset about density. How can I convince them that density can be a good thing? He says, no net loss of green space. Consolidate your green space and create three ways for walking and biking to places and for recreation for fitness. Okay, uh, and one of the things I wanted to come in uh, as a member of the Bicycle Advisory Co uh, Committee, we have asked the commission Please uh, adopt a complete street policy for the state of Texas, and also, and we have not heard that. And we have also asked that uh, that the safe school program, which is now optional, and the enhancement program, which is now optional, uh, be continued and expanded in the state of Texas. And I have not heard an answer yet from the commission. Uh, we don't know where it stands. It was both trails and safe to school were funded uh, up until MAP 21, and now the focus is on primarily access to transit with options that can be controlled by the community. Thank you. So I'd like to know where you all are with that. <laughs> Well, first of all, I appreciate you serving on, on, on that committee. I know it's very important, and I know that, that, that those, those, some, many of those recommendations and suggestions have been incorporated in, in transportation policy and reflected in actual uh, projects. I mean, in other words, streets. And the complete streets concept we're certainly aware of, and you begin to see elements of that. Well, the, 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 the new I-30 bridge is here in Arlington. I just came over one of them today. There's a good example. So it's beginning to manifest in terms of real projects on the streets today. And it's everything, this, 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 this bikes committee is advised on everything from, from uh, shoulder highway sh and rural areas, shoulder uh, uh, material construction to 
to, to, to facilitate bicycle riding to a number of different things. But in any event, it's a very good point. The new federal transportation legislation that's referred to as MAP 21 does not mandate or stipulate specifically that, for example, the enhancement programs that I referred to a moment ago, uh, some 320 years, 327 million, I think, is the number over the last decade that we've actually funded in Texas on, on programs like hike and bike trails. Um, we are not obligated to, uh, in Texas or any state, obligated to continue that program per se. And so it's going to be a state decision. And the Texas Transportation Commission that I serve on, there are five members, we have not made a decision as of yet, and those rules have not been, have actually are still in the formative stages. Um, my sense of it is that we would continue a commitment to the transportation program and to the transportation enhancement program or a program such as, like that, whatever it is that we call it. Um, you're correct, that was Rodney Ellis's legislation, the, the, the schools initiative uh, a few years ago, and that is, um, that too is optional, and I do not know the answer to the status of that at this point. Can I say, Lou, um, complete streets and safe routes to schools are in this document. Um, and they are elements, and I do want to say one other thing about this. I said it's local government actions to prevent childhood obesity, but this is a recipe for healthy communities. This is a recipe for how you design that healthy community and the value um, accrues not only to children but to everyone who lives in the community um, following this. this. Sure, local government actions to prevent childhood obesity. But the easy thing to do is rather than remember that, just remember Institute of Medicine and then go to their website and um, look look at uh, it, you can just click on obesity prevention and there are uh, there's just tomes uh, that, that you can look at this is the one with the nice pretty simple picture um, local government actions remember in your action groups you can recommend that we put some of these things on our vision North texas website I don't think I'm speaking out of turn on that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll make sure you have that information. That's okay. easy enough. I saw some hands up there in the in the northeast corner there. <laughs> Did, was I imagining that? Anybody have a question up there? There's one. Sue? Uh, just a quick question. Um, I was looking at the St. Louis School, and so the federal government decided not to fund that. Did we actually get any impact from the Um, I, I would say it, it obviously does. I, I think that um, understanding um, what the evidence base is about what works. So one other thing I would say to you is that um, the Institute of Medicine reports, the kinds of things that Richard Jackson talks about are evidence-based interventions. There are lots of great ideas out there, but it makes the most sense to kind of embrace those ideas around which there is an evidence base of success and a way to replicate what's been done. Um, and I think that when government at the state, um, at the federal, or at the local level um, make decisions that maybe the evidence would suggest is not the best decision in terms of health, um, we ought to figure out strategies to go back and revisit those issues with the folks who are making those decisions. Um, um, Sue and everyone in here, we've all been in that policy world. I like to think of policy world as a game of shoots and ladders. Uh, because you can be cruising along and you can think you're there and boom, you hit a slide and you go from number 99 back down to number 7 and you just got to start all over again. But you just keep playing until you win. You know, I might mention the Safe Routes to School program. Uh, it, it, perhaps we need to describe what that is as we're talking about, assuming everybody does. Oh, sure. no, basically, it is a program that in Texas, uh, from my recollection of it, was created in 07, in the legislative session of, of 07, introduced, uh, legislation introduced by Senator Rodney Ellis from Houston, and it basically speaks to the improvement of bicycle and pedestrian safety, school cro uh, bicycle crossings, sidewalk development, that sort of thing. In Texas, we have funded since 07 approximately $80 million uh, to the uh, uh, Safe Routes to School program. Uh, building projects and enhancing, enhancing safe routes to school across the state. Um, $80 million, I suspect, didn't cover a whole lot because $80 million sounds like a lot, but it's very quickly consumed. Mm -hmm. The question then is under the current new, or the new federal legislation known as MAP-21, there, 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 there is not the mandate as, uh, that we've had in the past to continue the program, so the question is going to fall back to the commission as to whether or not we're going to continue to fund it as we have. Thank you. 
Question right there. So, um, since you called me out, I'm going to speak up. <laughs> so, I would say to you, Vision North Texas is that think tank. And I would put it back on, there's no one industry, there's no one company that can do and take on the responsibility for all of this. So it's how do you create the space for folks to come together and start talking and thinking about this. I do agree with you, we need some hard numbers and we need um, economists to sit down and start um, 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 modeling for us what the value is. And in fact, I'm chair of something else called the National Commission on Prevention Priorities, which has begun developing a modeling methodology around how do you take the evidence-based recommendations about community health interventions and put those into the model and figure out some things that uh, might help you make the very decision you're talking about that's not the, um, this is the right thing to do um, uh, from a, from a um, kind of a social, moral, ethical perspective, but it's the right thing to do because it's going to save us some cash. Um, as a company, three things that we've been involved with um, tangentially at times that are going on that might um, provide some, some insight. One. Um, in, in Dallas anyway, but I think folks from Fort Worth came, the, the Federal Reserve Board of Dallas convened a meeting last year that was um, bringing together, um, rather than folks who were builders and architects and folks who are health folks, it was trying to bring together the banking community and the economic development folk and health folks and others. And that was a very, very interesting conversation because as we think about the built environment um, in the neighborhood I live in, um, Building a trail, not a problem. Uh, you, dr you drive down a few miles um, south from where I live, building a trail is a huge challenge um, because the money's not there and maybe even the, 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 the community interest isn't there because the things they deal with day to day are not about whether there's a trail or not. And so we, we've got to take that into account. So there, there are other think tank opportunities for us to participate in. Um, secondarily, um, we have a vested interest um, we are on the verge of an explosion of diabetes and heart disease that goes with it. And there is very compelling evidence that we can slow down the progression of something called pre-diabetes to diabetes by doing three, um, simple to say but not so simple to do, but you've already heard them today, eat healthier, be physically active, and maintain a healthy weight. Um, and there is a very compelling economic uh, case to be made for figuring out how we slow down the diabetes that's on the way. And so I would say, and we're materially in, invested in trying to pay for programs that do that better, and there are a number of programs now that um, do it in a, in a way that saves money. And then lastly, um, some of our community investments are very much about um, doing the right thing and trying to create that environment. So we are a big supporter of a program called Kaboom. And if you all know what Kaboom is, raise your hand. Um, so Kaboom, I would call Kaboom um, um, Habitat for Humanity um, for Playgrounds. Um, and it goes into a community and it works with a community. Generally, it's a community that has um, a dearth of playground and park space, sits with a, a community group and community folk and begin thinking about how uh, an investment can be made that not only puts a playground there, but all the things that go with a playground because swings, um, I can't do swings anymore. I don't know about you. I get really dizzy after about four or five swings. Um, but I don't mind sitting around and I don't mind um, being in a place where you can play. So health insurance companies, everyone needs to figure out how they can play a role at a conceptual kind of think tank level, at a, I've got a vested interest, um, di diabetes, and then in a, how do I use charitable dollars, because some of us work for organizations that have those charitable dollars that can be part of how you move the needle in the direction we want to move it. I am terribly frustrated, and I hope you are too, because we are out of time. <laughs> this has been a wonderful discussion. I really want to thank our panel and please give them a big round of applause.